So um, Y Combinator is actually the first accelerator. Um, we invented the concept that is now called an accelerator. The term came many years after Y Combinator began to do it. Um, and um, how, how it works is really simple. It's a three-month program. We do them twice a year. It's a three-month program. Startups come in the summer. They start in June. And we work with them really intensively for three months. We help them with their business. We help them with basically every aspect of the business from the product to the strategy to the marketing to the, the uh, business development and sales to hiring. And then at the end, it culminates in what we call a demo day, which is a chance to pitch to investors. And we have um, over 2,000 people who come to our, uh, over 2,000 investors who come to the YC demo day every, every batch. So it's um, a really good opportunity to raise money and the vast majority of the companies are successful. Um, we started Y Combinator in 2006, and since then we funded 1,300 companies, roughly, which is, I think, more than anyone. Um, and because we've been doing it for a long time, we've just learned a lot about how to fund different kinds of companies. For the first five years of Y Combinator, we funded mainly software companies, because Y Combinator was started by software people, and software was what they understood. But in the last five years, we've made a really strong push to fund all kinds of companies. And so we began funding um, hardware companies, and then we did biotech, and now we've done hard sciences and all kinds of things. Uh, we've done three nuclear companies, um, Helion, which is, a, which is building a fusion reactor, Oclo, which is building portable fission reactors uh, for remote locations, and a company called Gecko Robotics, which makes wall climbing robots that can clean power plants so humans don't have to go inside. And um, we'd, we'd really love to fund more big ideas, more, more, more hard science ideas, and more nuclear ideas in particular. We have a lot of people at Y Combinator who are really interested in nuclear and the future of energy. So I'm really excited to be here to hopefully convince so many people to do Y Combinator in the future. Can you briefly also talk about the equity model of Y Combinator? Yeah. So how Y Combinator works um, is we invest in all the companies. So we invest $120,000, which is not a lot of money, um, but it's, it's, it's enough. So how we make money is we invest in the companies, we get a little bit of equity, um, about 7% in return for the, ex for the money that we invest, and then some of those companies go on to be really, really successful. So Y Combinator is funded now 10 companies that are worth over a billion dollars. We were the, we, uh, the, the ones which you probably know are Airbnb, Dropbox, Instacart, Stripe, um, all, all came out of Y Combinator. And when those companies do well, Y Combinator makes money. So the, the cool thing is we're, we're very like aligned with the companies. We, we make money only when the companies are very successful. So thanks everyone uh, for having me here today. This is really exciting. Um, to see all you, you guys here learning about entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, I'll say that one thing about Y Combinator, I think you know, Y Combinator as um, sort of the founder of this whole idea has uh, you know, inspired a lot of efforts. And I think one of the, the cool things about the Y Combinator story is that I, I, I believe it was sort of, it's kind of an organic kind of grassroots thing when it originated, right? In, in yeah, it was. It was not originally intended as a business. It was intended as an experiment. Um, and, yeah. and we was just run for a summer, and then it sort of became successful accidentally. Yeah, which I think is a, a really cool aspect of the story. I think that there's some of that element to what we do at Cyclotron Road. So um, Cyclotron Road is, is basically an incubator program uh, for really early stage uh, hard energy technology companies that's based at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, which is about a quarter mile up the hill that way. Um, I think you've already, you already had a chance to hear from Beth from our team uh, last week. Um, and the main program that we run is our cohort program, which is essentially a two-year intensive fellowship in entrepreneurship for scientists and engineers. Uh, and so you, the, the program as a whole kind of combines those two elements. Um, so for those of you that don't know uh, about Berkeley Lab, it's about an $800 million a year research facility. Uh, there's about 4,000 4, scientists working there. 13 Nobel Prizes have come out of it. Um, it's a phenomenal research institution. Um, the idea for Cyclotron Road is really to take that platform uh, for doing research, uh, really early stage research, and uh, put it to use as an incubator or to basically as a platform for scientist entrepreneurs. Um, so the way the program works 
is we run a national competition. So that's where the, you know, it's, it's not just stuff coming out of Berkeley. We, we actually uh, take applicants from all over the country. Um, we look for people that, you know, are technically very skilled and highly trained, but also are, have entrepreneurial motivations. Want to, you know, they don't want to go build a research career as an academic. They don't want to go work for a big company. They're really excited to drive uh, an entrepreneurial idea forward. And then we basically bring those people to Berkeley Lab and let them leverage all of the research, both the, the research infrastructure, the tools, the facilities, et cetera, and the expertise that's there. Um, and the program uh, runs for two years. Over those two years, uh, our team, which has experience starting several hard tech startups uh, over many years, we have two former ARPA-E program managers on our team, uh, as well as a bunch of experience uh, with uh, relation to venture capital and philanthropic capital. Um, over those two years, our team basically uh, provides mentorship, guidance, access to a really tailored network of individuals that think about how to take hard science-based technologies to market. Um, and the goal is basically, over those two years, for you to take your idea from uh, early proof of concept. So most of the technologies that come into our program are, you know, maybe there's been some early work done in the lab, there's been a couple papers published, sometimes it's even just an idea. Um, and to get to a point in two years where you have sort of a first, either proof of product or proof of system uh, that is relevant to the private sector, where the private sector can actually look at it and say, hey, that's something interesting, let's see how we can move that forward. Um, so we've been running the program for two years. Uh, we've had two cohorts of six, uh, six companies each, uh, comprising 17 people total. Um, and our first, uh, first group of companies is about to graduate from the program later this year. Um, we combined some aspects of Accelerator Mount. We have, well, we're gonna have a demo day in about a month as well. Um, so we sort of try to you know, incubate the company and also accelerate it and put it in front of investors and get people um, excited to try to take it forward. Um, so we'll, I guess the, the other last relevant piece of information is that we're actually, we haven't supported any nuclear companies yet, but we're um, we're very excited to to try to get more nuclear companies and people uh, innovators into our application pipeline. So uh, there, I think our platform is very well set up to support really early stage breakthrough ideas uh, in nuclear and elsewhere. Um, so uh, we'll be opening applications for our next cohort this fall. Come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested in that. But uh, looking forward to chatting with everyone else here. Thanks. Awesome, yeah, and to, you know, to give you a little bit of flavor of my background, uh, we founded Lindos five years ago because what we, what we really saw was there wasn't as much uh, support in the early ecosystem for hardware startups. And my background before this, I spent five years in the Air Force building the strongest laser in the world for missile defense. So it was a megawatt class laser. We could blow up missiles at over 100 miles. So you know, for me, like, my whole background has been typically in like, big, meaty hardware projects. And our model, the way it works, is we typically invest a quarter to half a million dollars. It's typically two to three people in an idea. So we like to be really early because our whole thing is that hardware, you know, hardware like doesn't succeed accidentally. There's a process and rigor that's really required, and that's what we focus on. So typically we work with our companies really closely for anywhere between nine and 18 months. You know, we do formal product requirements documents. You know, if you're a more mass market good, we'll really make sure that you understand how DFM and how scale manufacturing works. If you're on the high tech side, which I tend to cover a lot of, you know, we have things like in our portfolio like Spire, which is a non-imaging satellite company. We have drones, we have robotics, as you saw earlier. And for that, it's really about understanding what the milestones are that are going to unlock that later sets of venture capital. You know, <coughs> money, for better or worse, is like oxygen to an early stage startup. And for us, what we really try to make sure that you get to is that you've got to have a milestone. Because unfortunately, for, especially for a high tech thing, if you are just short of like a working demo, like investors don't care. Right, like that, that's, the, that's what kills these types of startups is that if you're almost there, like, sure, like maybe you can get someone to invest, but it's like when you have that, you know, that first reaction, that first test data, or that first flight, whatever it is. You know, for Spire, you know, they built their first satellites in our warehouse, old warehouse in San Francisco, and the first time they got two birds on orbit, and those first bits they got back downlinked to their San Francisco headquarters, like that was a watershed moment. They could go to all these investors and say, hey, here's real data from space. We are capable of actually putting something in orbit and getting it down. 
And for, I think, a lot of the high-tech companies, which I'm super excited to fund, it's really about having that kind of clear vision. And so with us being able to, we can invest up to a million dollars. I mean, for us, that gives us the flexibilities to really allow our companies to like, get the, make the progress, get those milestones for that kind of magic inflection point. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. So uh, Positron Dynamics, we founded the company uh, with the simple idea of uh, putting antimatter where people have been talking about using antimatter for a number of things ever since it was discovered and we wanted to set out to actually do it. Um, we, we've actually been through a couple of programs, well, uh, one accelerator program, and uh, uh, our first investment actually came from Breakout Labs, which is uh, an initiative of the TO Foundation. Uh, so uh, that has a slightly different model, and I can elaborate on that Absolutely. if people are interested. Uh, so Breakout Labs put in a modest amount of money. Uh, the, the, they fund great range of companies that work on biotech and all, all kinds of cool hard science companies. It's a very interesting group to work with the, uh, to just to share the experiences with the other founders and uh, their, their experiences raising uh, fundraising and so on. Uh, so that was Breakout Labs. Uh, well, what really got us going was, uh, after that, was Alchemist Accelerator. Uh, so uh, that's an accelerator program. We were uh, in class 10 of it. Uh, and uh, that basically allowed us to really learn how to raise funds. I mean, the three of us who co-founded the company were technical founders. We, we had zero background in how to run a business uh, or how to raise money. And so uh, Alchemist really put us through the paces and um, we were able to raise a, a, a very good uh, round last year. Um, and so those are, the one is an accelerator, Breakout Labs, uh, I, I don't know the official way they describe them, so I would say it's like a seed kind of investment. Uh, and then the third sort of prong was uh, a facility now called The Switch, it used to be called iGate out of Livermore, California. Uh, and, and, and that was incredibly awesome because, so we've been able to set up a lab in the basement in downtown Livermore uh, with a radioactive safety license. <laughs> <laughs> and probably nobody up, up on the street knows that that's happening down there. But <laughs> just off the of five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's possible. What does, we've we covered what the incubators and accelerators kind of offer, but what would make it a difference compared to a company that didn't go through an incubator and accelerator? Why would a company choose to go this route instead of uh, just, just a pure startup route and trying to get VC on their own? You know, I think for us, one thing that we really focus on is just how dynamic the ecosystem is. There's this kind of this weird thing of like, you know, as a founder, when you go out to like raise a seed round, you know, you know the most about raising a seed round the day after you close it. And unfortunately, that like that data is almost like worthless after that because it's like how you raise a seed round is kind of different than how you raise an A round because you know A rounds are typically one major investor, whereas seed rounds are typically multi-party rounds. So for us, it's like because we're really involved with our companies, we get to see like the dynamics of the venture ecosystem, and there's no like overwhelming law of physics. Like it's a dynamic ecosystem that just changes. Like last fall, the market shit the bed, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of people freaked out. And so we saw like an overnight, like a market step back of certain types of things. And so for us, it's like because it's our job to really understand how that works and how these companies grow. Um, it, I think that it's really helpful to like work with early people who specialize in early stage to kind of help prep you and help build your company because those, those nucleus of your company, how you start to build early on, it really does, once you're at 10, 20 people, it's so hard to change if you've got like systemic problems built in. Um, and that's really what we're there to help out with. So, before I did this panel, I went and I, I talked to all three of the nuclear companies that we'd funded, and I asked them the same question. I asked them, what did you guys get out of Y Combinator that was most valuable? And I'll tell you the thing I expected to hear. The thing I expected to hear was money, because not so much Y Combinator's investment, which is small, but all three of the companies raised many, many millions of dollars um, from other investors that they met at Y Combinator's uh, demo day. and like you were saying all these are expensive projects, they need a lot of capital, money is the fuel which makes it happen. So I thought all, all of them were gonna say, well, it was the tens of millions of dollars that we were able to raise in the aftermath. And what's, what's interesting is that all three of them had a different answer. Um, and all three of them said that the thing that was most valuable from going through Y Combinator was that it made their companies go faster. I, and it, all, all three of these companies are, came out of university research 
And when they did Y Combinator, it was like the transition from the university world to the commercial world. And what the guys at Helion told me was that at the university world, they had been working on Helion for eight years doing sort of grant cycles where they got half a million to a million dollars a year and they were incentivized primarily to publish research. And when they did Y Combinator, it, cha it changed their whole mindset about the right priorities to focus on, the way to get iteration cycles going faster, and having exposure to the whole commercial side of the world, to software companies and hardware companies that are making products for profit, changed their whole mindset. And they said that in the year after Y Combinator, they got more done in the eight years before. And so they said that was actually the most valuable thing. So I'll add a little perspective um, <coughs> Mark from, from Cyclotron Road. You know, so I think to generically answer your question, I think it depends. Um, it can depend on what stage your company is at um, and what, you know, what your goals are and how you're trying to grow your company. Um, so one of the one of the observations and one of the motivations for us starting Selectron Road was that, in our view, not all companies are ne necessarily appropriate for a venture capital growth model. Um, and I'm curious to hear what the other panels, panels have, have to say about that and, and sort of how they approach specifically the hardware companies. Um, but we, what our team and, and, and myself and my co-founder, Elon, who you'll hear from this afternoon, um, uh, observed was that there were a lot of companies in the last, especially in, in energy, uh, and especially in energy, sort of hard tech, hardware, in the last 5, 10, 15 years that got started on venture capital dollars uh, and then ended up not being successful. And in fact, it's pretty hard to find uh, the real big su success stories out of venture capital funding, early stage, uh, what do you call it, clean tech, but really hard hardware and clean technology. And so for us, one of the things that we are hoping to enable, and it's an experiment, is that by giving people a lot of resources at the very early stage, giving them access to labs, giving them access to funding, um, we can help set those startups up for a different set of options in terms of what the business model is that they take, they use to take their company forward. Um, and we're still too early in this experiment to know what the results are, uh, but we have some early indicators. Um, where we've seen some of our companies come through the program, learn a little bit about what their, you know, develop their technology further, think uh, more deeply about the business model and realize that, you know what, the venture model is the way that we're gonna go with this and we're gonna go raise the venture dollars and beyond the rocket ship. Have, has the group had a, any education on venture capital up to this point? Okay. Um, what we've seen also is that a few of our companies have gone through that process, worked on their technology, thought about their business model, and said, you know what, that doesn't, that, that doesn't make any sense for us. We're not actually gonna build a billion dollar company based on this product. Um, what we're gonna actually shoot for is trying to get those early critical results that will allow us to go talk to a strategic partner and get acquired uh, you know, two or three years from now. Um, for a smaller dollar amount. So, you know, you probably heard that the, the general venture capital outcome is looking for the billion dollar companies or bust. Um, and uh, getting acquired for $20 million by a strategic partner is not really a win for the venture capital model. Um, if <coughs> you're developing a new battery material, if you're developing a, you know, I, um, for nuclear, I think I think it's interesting to think about what the right way to take it forward is and probably to put them in the company, but um, what we try to enable is different outcomes that are consistent with different business models. Um, that being said, I think if you're, look, if you're on the venture trajectory, um, or I think Breakout Labs is an interesting, another interesting model, um, and depending on what stage you're at, there are, are sort of different incubators and accelerators that sit along that chain at various points. So. I don't know if you, well, you to, to your point, I mean, venture capital is for almost to that. venture capital for almost no, like in terms of all the companies starting here, it's like this very narrow slice. And I, there's yeah. this old adage that I think succinctly sums it up: is that venture capital is rocket fuel, and if you put into cars, they explode. Right. And so, so like <laughs> the, the worst thing you can do <laughs> is like if, 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 if your business like can't go be there, like that's fine. That, that's yeah. great. And there's a bunch of other ways to fund companies, get it off the ground. But right. I think there's been this kind of like you know kind of 
fetishization of like raising venture capital. And so I think that, you know, that I've seen founders who like have an idea that like could be a great business for them, but just probably not for like a series A investor. And that if you cram yourself and contort yourself, it's, you're, you're, you sign your own death sentence if you, if you do it wrong, so. Is it okay if I respond to that? Sure. Yeah. So it's true that from the standpoint of VCs, they only make money from the companies that get really big. But here's, here's the thing that I don't want you guys to take away. I don't want the people in this room to walk away saying, well, I just have this little idea. I don't know how it's going to become a billion dollar company, so venture capital must not be right for me. If other founders had taken that same approach, companies like Google, Facebook, and SpaceX all would not exist because all three of those companies, when the founders started them, they had no idea how it would become a billion dollar company and they didn't even have the ambition to create one. You guys, I'm sure, have heard that Larry and Sergey tried to sell the, the, the page rank algorithm to Yahoo for a million dollars. The only reason Google exists is because Yahoo didn't want to pay a million dollars for the algorithm. And so, and um, when I was at, a, 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 I, I, I can, I can tell you a story from my own experience. Uh, I was a student at Harvard in 2005, and I was having dinner in the cafeteria one night, and this friend of mine sat down, and he was telling me about this website that he just made in his dorm room for Harvard students to get to know each other. And um, he had no particular plans for this website. It was just like he was annoyed that the Harvard software for, for listing Harvard students was really hard to use, and he was like, well, I just built a better version. Of course, that website went on to become Facebook, and the guy was Mark. Um, and and so, like, don't don't feel that just because you don't have the ambition now to start a billion-dollar company, that you won't ever do it. Often, these things just kind of like fall into people's laps. Paul, do you want to speak to why you chose your routes that you chose? Yeah, uh, uh, any startup is an experiment. Uh, so, uh, so I think yeah, it's definitely uh, it ultimately comes down to you know what is the risk-taking uh, capability of person who wants to give you money, uh, and uh, some people are willing to take more risk uh, in, you know, in the hope that it'll lead to something really awesome, uh, and, and, and then you know, some are not. And so it'll, it'll take a lot of conversations to find the right match with an uh, investor, or, or even the right route uh, to, to get your company going. Uh, I would say that if, if you do have a facility like the Berkeley Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, you know, and you can use that to, to kind of build on your technology. That if you take that opportunity, if you can, uh, it, it is pretty hard to set up a lab from you know zero. Uh, but there are other benefits when you do that as well. So, especially what from here makes a difference for companies that translates to nuclear. Like why why would a nuclear startup uh, specifically do you think? maybe be a fit for an for a, a accelerator incubator model? I know, I think, I think you know, this was kind of mentioned earlier, it's like, I, I think that, especially there's this problem, like well, this, there's this difficulty, like to start a nuclear company, like pretty high tech. Like you're, you're gonna need multiple technical founders, you're gonna have to really understand like the science. And I, and I think that, you know, a lot of times in, in my experience, like they're not coming from communities with extensive like entrepreneurial background and like the venture ecosystem is kind of this funky ecosystem. So I think that, you know, when I talk to very technical teams, a, a, th a thing that we can add is just like really helping like, you know, guide you early on to make sure you don't make kind of fatal mistakes. Because there's a lot of like little decisions you're going to make in that first year, 18 months, and it's always an experiment you're always iterating. But just having a little bit of feedback, and you know, it's from us. It's from like you know, a lot of times we we'll, we always like mentor or companies with like people who are farther along in a similar type thing. So our high tech companies will go talk to Peter Platz or Aspire and have him come in and have you know, he's great at giving mentorship about like specific things that he did that worked or didn't work when he dealt with VCs or just built his team. And I think that there's a lot of team building, there's a lot of like, non-technical stuff that goes on that uh, can be really brought to bear. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for nuclear startups in particular, um, you know, well, I, I think, I think it depends. Again, it sort of depends on what kind. They're sort of. They're, I think I, I've actually. I was. I was hearing earlier that some of the teams are working on more kind of, um, sort of like Internet of Things type applications for their projects here. There's like some more sort of hard science or hard hard tech oriented. Um, but I think, you know, the things inc incubators and accelerators can provide are, you know, basically reducing the cost of, of and time that it takes to move your idea forward. Um, so I, and I think every incubator, I mean one of the interesting things about incubators and accelerators is that there's so many of them and, and 
a lot of them have uh, very different models for how they support companies. Um, there's a, an incubator program in Hawaii called Energy Accelerator um, that's really focused on uh, helping companies do pilot demonstrations like in the Hawaii marketplace, in the economy there. Um, and so that can be really valuable for companies that are looking to deploy a pilot and have access to that, that market and that network very quickly. Um, and you know, for, for us, it's access to a national lab to do that really early stage R&D so you don't have to go out and raise millions of dollars to build your lab. Um, and I think for, for, for other incubators and accelerators, the, the, the value proposition for the startup is, is also different. Um, it really varies. You said that you went through, you were part of Team 10. So there's all these, these kind of groups uh, and their, their programs. Can you kind of describe like a day in the life of, of specifically your program, if it's a long-term program or if it's one of these short programs? I know you mentioned you all have a three-month cycle. What, what are some of the differences in experience that you've been through a couple of them? What's that, that day in the life or, or couple of months in the cycle experience that makes incubators so unique? Yeah, uh, the program we went through at Optimist is a six-month program, so it's double the length of Y Combinator. Uh, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it, the way it's set up, it's pretty flexible uh, in, in terms of, you know, they have every other week or every week their sessions where they bring in advisors, and founders of companies, and things like that. These are, uh, you know, very carefully curated sessions with you know, people with the right sort of expertise. You know, uh, when I first got into Alchemist, uh, I was like, hmm, uh, all these other guys are software companies and, you know, we're just like odd duck in here. But you do learn that many of the problems that you're facing as a startup are similar. It, it just so happens you're working in a different area than the other people. Uh, so uh, so the, these weekly sessions were very useful. Uh, they do these uh, sort of rapid fire investor uh, speed dating type uh, events where basically they put you in a room, uh, you have to pitch 10 investors back to back, uh, and then you know, by the end of it you have, certainly have a much better pitch deck. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you may have a couple of meetings about that. So uh, this sort of experience was very useful. They do have uh, a mentor, uh, th th there are plenty of mentors and uh, there's a pretty vast, Ravi Bellani who runs Alchemist has a pretty vast network. He's also a uh, professor at Stanford Business School. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, an email from him to an investor like opens you up to a meeting uh, and then from there, you, you've got to take it from there. But uh, it does, it's, it's, a, it's pretty great to be able to connect with investors who, uh, you know, you're somewhat pre-screened, right? They've, they've, they've been, they're people he knows, the people, he knows invests in a certain type of company uh, or a certain type of team. Uh, and so that sort of experience is very useful. Uh, Breakout Labs was also very useful in that regard, like uh, basically uh, introducing us to you know, other strategic investors, people, VCs, uh, and things like that. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and we had many opportunities to pitch uh, to a kind of elite group of investors through Breakout Labs as well. You know, for us, uh, different hardware takes a different amount of time. And when we make our investment, we actually invest the amount of money we think will last them through like how long we think it takes to actually hit that kind of first major milestone. And for us, it's pretty, you know, I said we're pretty hands-on. So typically you're meeting with someone from our team two or three times a week. Um, if you're fundraising, you're probably gonna be meeting with my partner, Helen, because she helps companies on fundraising. Uh, if you're in the middle of like engineering, you're probably gonna be meeting with my partner, Eric, who tends to run more of the, you know, things like the product departments documents. You know, if, if it's more of like network stuff, you know, I'm probably meeting with you. But for us, it's all tailored, which is, you know, for us, we're a low volume shop. We only wanna do about 10 deals a year because we really wanna be able to spend the right amount of time with those teams to really help like advance them to the next level. So it really, I'll change it over that course of that typically nine to 12 months. Um, but you know, several contacts week is what we typically have. Yeah, so I mean, I think for us as a, as a two year long program, where it's even more kind of diffuse, um, but we, we try to provide a lot of uh, different touch points with, with our team through that process. So um, all of our teams are doing research in the lab, so a good chunk of their time is actually you know, setting up their lab, actually doing work in the labs. There's also a few different, um, what are called user facilities at the National Lab, so the, the Molecular Foundry is a great example. It's a nanoscience facility. Uh, a bunch of our teams are working in there. 
Um, we then provide sort of a, a few different types of interaction uh, to support support you in the program. Um, we do monthly sort of deep dive one-on-ones with our team. Um, we do uh, quarterly kind of project reviews uh, that are a bit more formal. Um, we do a bunch of different sort of programming and educational activities. So we have guest speakers coming in, um, uh, a bunch of hard tech founders coming in and speaking to the teams. We, we have a course on techno-economic modeling um, and then a bunch of other kind of ad hoc case-by-case -case, um, interactions as needed uh, to support the progress of teams. Um, and then we also do a bunch of kind of events that are focused on both community and on mentorship. So uh, we do a weekly happy hour, which I think you guys are all coming to tonight. Um, and then we also have uh, an advisory network of mentors that we uh, connect all of our teams to. So across all those things, you know, the, the actual, I guess, burden on your time of the program itself is probably 10 to 15% of your, your full work week. The rest is you, for you to manage the growth of your the development of both your technology and your business. Um, but it's over a two-year span, so that actually ends up being quite a bit of interaction. Do you want to speak more to three-month ball? Sure. So the Y Combinator program is short but intense. It's only three months, but a lot of our founders tell us it was the most intense three months of their life. During Y Combinator, we meet with the companies once or twice a week, and we have lots of events and things like that. Um, but a, a, big, a big component of Y Combinator is actually the startups getting to know each other. So because we fund companies in a batch of about 100 to 150 companies, there's a lot of companies there um, that are doing something that is similar to you, that are sharing your problems in some way. When I first got to Y Combinator, I, I, I had the idea, huh, we have all these hard science companies. Why don't we like cloister them off in their own like mini YC where it can be like all the hard science companies together? And uh, I asked a bunch of companies about this, and like unanimously, it was voted down as like the worst idea ever. The companies love being mixed together. The 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 hardware companies find it really s helpful to be mixed with software companies that are iterating faster to get inspired to work more like a software company. And so I think that's um, a big strength of 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 joining a, an accelerator program where you can meet a lot of companies. Yeah, I think that's a very key point. I mean, well, what, what's the thing that distinguishes your project from something that's like an academic research project that you know, happens over many years at a very slow rate? Uh, you know, it's really like being inspired by, oh, you can iterate on ideas quicker. Uh, you can get to the solution quicker or fail quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you guys have questions? Sorry for that. So uh, as a computer startup, how would you teach yourself to be honest, I think you know. I think Jared's totally right. Like, their most early stage investors won't touch it, but like, you're not going to change that. And I think it's really like, like honestly, for for hardcore nuclear startups, there may be ten investors in the world who are really good fits for you. And like, just go find and talk to those people because they're willing. You know, people like YC, your founders fund, you know, us. Like, we there are people who want to take those big risks, and it's about finding it. Like, if someone has made all their money and done all their investing doing social media apps, the probability that like you're going to walk in and then be like, holy shit, nuclear power, let's do that. Like, it's, that's just not how people work, right? So I think, I think it's like about finding like that fit for you. And it's like, and, and there are, and the, and the great thing is that, you know, I think that there are a lot more people who are starting to look at it. You know, there was like little, certainly a little bit of a clean tech hiccup in the mid 2000s, but now you're starting to see people come back to it and, and, and go find those people. And I think it's a really exciting time to be doing, you know, hardware, hard tech and like nuclear tech things. Um, well, does anybody else have a comment on that? Oh, that was great. Go to Mark and then Andreas. Do you, you have a question, Mark? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay, so our idea is a little bit more niche oriented for new careers. If you're thinking about adding a service to the website itself, so my uh, question is how do you, how would you suggest um, safety and get, uh, I guess, components where you need somebody to advise you on the website, how to do it properly versus Still, there's a certain need for the industry and how to not let one side or the other kind of get away from the main idea. Because it's very easy to start thinking of, like, oh, you know, like, this is a website, so we should orient it kind of what type of company will do. Uh, 
but that's not the main idea. The main idea is still the balls around nuclear. So how would you, I guess, suggest pitching that or for investors say, how would you, would you consider that a nuclear center or a service company? Um, and how would you have a label it? Who, who's your, who, um, who do you think your customer is? Or who, who, who do you? So I, I don't know. I mean, I let the others comment as well, but I think framing it in terms of who your you know who your target market is, who the customer is, and what your jaw-dropping value proposition is for that customer. Um, you know, I think I think invest that's investors will understand that, and then you know it's just a matter of figuring out how to deliver that product to that to that market. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I I I'm not sure I understood the question about getting confused between the two sides, but I think like just really focusing on what your value proposition is, value proposition is for that, that target market. Um, I don't know, others have. So it's a community site for people in the nuclear industry? Yes. Okay, okay. So um, the cool thing about that is that like, um, to Jeremy's point earlier, because you're not actually building nuclear reactors, there's probably a wider class of investors that would consider Absolutely. investing in this. And I think the gap is that those investors don't really know the nuclear industry, so it's not obvious to them that people would want this. And so the thing to do is to prove to them that people would want it. And you can do that without actually having a lot of users. You can just go and talk to a lot of people in the, in the industry and get a lot of feedback that they want it, and that'll help build the case that this is actually solving an important problem. So building kind of off of that, um, that question of, of what, what makes people successful, and you mentioned that somebody came through and decided that the accelerator, I don't remember if that was Jeremy or Sebastian, but you mentioned that somebody decided the accelerator model wasn't for them and that it was better to, to do the more traditional VC. What, what in that partnership, I know that you all offer support and then you take some equity, but what, what makes you decide that, that, you're, that you're not a fit maybe? Um, well, so, so to clarify um, my comment earlier, um, be because this person went through our program, they were able to identify whether or not the VC path was the right growth path for us. So it wasn't that they, 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 they decided not to do our program and instead go through a VC path. Um, our, our program gave them the runway at the early stage to, to, to do the critical sort of early technology development and the critical thinking about their business model that allowed them to say, you know what, I think there is a market opportunity here that is appropriate for venture capital, and now they're actually, you know, will we'll, we'll very soon actually be in a position uh, to, to raise their first financing. Um, on the contrary, we've had teams that came through our program and based on that process, decided that their track was going to be to try to work directly with industry uh, through joint development agreements uh, and things like that to scale their technology, but not on a venture business model with the goal not being the, the sort of venture path. Um, and so the, the point there is that, you know, for what, what we hope to achieve with our program is for someone um, that's just getting started with, with hard science-based technology to give them that runway where they can actually go through those learning cycles and figure out what the right path and the right partners and the right financing is for them to move forward. Um, and then to clarify another point, we, so we don't take any equity. Our, our funding actually comes from the Department of Energy. So um, we, we fund you for those two years without taking any equity. Um, That's the, the philanthropic kind of side of things. Yeah, it's, a go it's government funded. Um, and you know, I think the Breakout Labs is actually a philanthropic model-ish. Um, <laughs> it's sort of halfway in between investment. And do you want to do you want to speak to the semi philanthropic model? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't know if I'm best equipped to talk about their model, but uh, yeah, uh, but but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it is more on. Well, I'd say it's philanthropic in the sense that they're willing to take bigger risks, like you know, fund companies that normally nobody else would at that early stage. Uh, yeah. Mark? Uh, and it's like, it's all a bit of a similar saying here, but there's um, 30 or 25 of us in this room, and last Monday we had 30 ideas 
you know, and I'm just wondering if there's going to be some opportunity, I don't know if you guys are hanging around today or whatever, but is there going to be some opportunity for you guys to listen to some of our, those ideas? Because only what five got picked, you know, and there's a wealth of ideas there. So is there going to be some opportunity for that today? Or? Probably all ears. <laughs> we have lunch afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So mm. Speaking for myself, also, like, you're always welcome to reach out to us at uh, Y County. Are you going to share contact information after this? Yeah, all okay. the. Yes. Okay. So you'll have our contact information. Anyone in this room, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm always happy to talk if I trade you. Yeah, same. It's super easy. Like, for, for me, it's like super easy to get a hold of me, like, anytime. And, and speak, like, speaking on that, how, do you want to talk about the application process? I know Y Combinator, you submit kind of an application. I'm not familiar with, with everybody else's application. But do you want to talk about how you, because if you do your own startup, you kind of go get the money on your own. You don't have to write an application, but maybe coming from academia, you'll understand grants. So do you want to talk about that maybe? Sure. So the Y Combinator application is super straightforward. It's an online application. It's the only way we, we, we uh, accept companies, just like a grant application. Um, we read all the applications and then we do one round of interviews and then we can choose who to accept. So very simple. Um, if you are unsure if you should apply, like you just want to talk to someone at Y Combinator to see if it's a good fit, you're always welcome to reach out to us and we're happy to talk to you about applying. For us, it's, you know, uh, we just email it to me. It's like how it works. I run all our, all our deal flow stuff and it's like, and honestly, it's everything as simple as just like, you know, you and your idea and like that's all. I mean, we've done investments that started with me just talking to people like six months before they wanted to start a, start a company and they're like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about like, you know, kind of where like I'm thinking of and maybe down selecting from two or three ideas. I'm happy to brainstorm on things like that as well. Yeah. So uh, our our process is a little bit more is is again longer. <laughs> um, we try to keep it very straightforward, very simple. Um, to apply for the program, you just have to submit basically a five-page application uh, that tells a little bit about you and what your idea is and why you think your idea would be a good fit for our program. Um, and then we run through a process uh, where we do uh, external review with a bunch of uh, sort of experts from both industry and academia. Um, we do phone interviews, we do two rounds of in-person interviews, and then based on that we make the, the selection. So, you know, we, we get on the order of 150 applications for each round and we select uh, five or six each, or five or six startups each year. Um, so it is, it's sort of, it, it's about a four month process from when you submit the application to when you are selected, um, and it's it's fairly intensive, um, but a lot of it is mainly focused on us getting a lot of talk time and face time with you to get to know you and why you're motivated to, to move your idea forward. Um, much much the same, we're we're excited to talk to people about what their ideas are anytime, and um, you know you can contact me to to do that. Yeah, and I can, I can mention uh, the application processes for uh, Breakout Labs and Alchemist. Uh, Breakout Labs, online application, very similar. You submit a pre-application kind of outlining your concept and uh, technical background of it. It's a very technical oriented application. Uh, and then if it passes the pre-screening, then you're invited to submit uh, a longer proposal. It's about 10 pages. Uh, and then that gets peer reviewed uh, by experts in the area uh, and, and then there are conversations and then they decide to invest in you. Uh, Alchemist, the way we chanced upon Alchemist was kind of random. Uh, we were on, we happened to create an Angelist profile. Uh, those of you, if you check out Angelist, it yeah, could be helpful. Uh, but uh, we inadvertently applied to, to Alchemist <laughs> by clicking a button. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then we get this email like, oh, you guys are a great fit. You guys should come pitch. And we're like, whoa, enterprise software. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, uh, but then, you know, they convinced us, oh, yeah, you should come and pitch. And we're totally interested. We have, like, less than a quantum computing company or two. And, and they had some examples. And I was like, okay. Uh, and so uh, there it was more of a 15 minute Skype call, uh, an interview of basically with uh, like a panel of two or three folks. And uh, they bring in, typically bring in a person who has expertise in your area. Uh, and then after that, they send you a convertible note and, and then you go from there. And, and real fast before we move on, um, can you talk about the fellowship 
model instead of just like the tip because Y Combinator also has a fellowship program? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we, we launched a program, sort of an experimental thing to fund even earlier stage companies that can't move to the Bay Area. So we funded a bunch of companies around the world uh, with a smaller amount of money because $12,000 goes really far in Ghana, it turns out. But I don't, I don't, I don't think it's the best fit for the companies in his room. <clears throat> So it sounds like um, a good amount of technical development and research can take place even within an incubator or an accelerator. Um, uh, do incubators or accelerators provide any support in terms of IP uh, that's developed under uh, the auspices of the program? I'm not sure what you mean by support. Like, so, like equipment? Do you? I mean, do you uh, do you provide like community like help? Contacting IP lawyers, uh, connections in terms of like law firms that will help you write patent applications for things you develop while uh, doing technical research inside the incubator or accelerator. I mean, uh, like for us, and I'm sure this is true of everyone. Like any basic kind of like service provider, I'm sure we all have lists of preferred ones. Like we we have a couple IP lawyers that we we really like worked with that our companies have. Um, but you know, and honestly, we also have like community lists where you can ping the network and you'll get like. And intros to like things like that, but I mean, like for all, I mean, I think for all early stage investors, it's like certainly part of it is like having like a rolodex of like okay, you need lawyers, you need a banker, you need an accountant. You know, it's all pretty standard stuff. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we've heard today that it's good to be in the Bay Area, it's good to be in Boston. Um, we had one of our like required readings for this was this whole thing about how you shouldn't move to Silicon Valley if you want to do a startup, you should stay where you are. Um, so my question is, I'm from Philadelphia. If I want to start my startup in Philadelphia, does that mean I have to find other companies that are, exist like yours in Philadelphia, or can I just take a trip out here for a little bit? Um, how much does location matter as long as you can communicate? I mean, I guess what I'll say is I had two friends in Boston who came out here to fundraise, and both of them moved here at the end of their trips. It's a, it's, it's a complicated question. There are a lot of factors. There are legitimate reasons to start companies in, in other places. But I will say, and so we, we spent a lot of time talking to companies about this, and we, the advice is not always the same. Mm -hmm. But I will say that sort of on average, the most common case is companies initially are very skeptical. They're from some other place. I'm from the East Coast um, myself. I we originally started our company in Boston. I'd never been to the Bay Area. I had no desire to move 3,000 miles away to California. It didn't make any sense to me. I was very skeptical. Um, and then I tried to raise money in Boston for like six months, and we failed. When we moved to the Bay Area, and we, we raised money in like six days. and. Um, not just that, but also just the, the people around here. The, the level of intensity and sophistication um, is, so, is just so unparalleled anywhere else in the world that I became convinced that for most companies, most of the time, the Bay Area is probably the place to be. Yeah, in terms of fundraising unparalleled and being able to like, go, just go meet people uh, and people who want to meet with you, uh, if, if your company requires a very specific infrastructure that if only a particular area could provide, then maybe there's a benefit to mm -hmm. setting it up. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would echo everything that's been said. I think um, thinking about what, you know, if you're thinking about not moving here or staying where you are or moving somewhere else, you know, thinking about what are the, the resources in that region that you can leverage. Um, to start your company, uh, whether it's you know being able to incubate like at your university or, or use research tools there, or at another university, like thinking about what you know what are the, the resources and the tools and the you know that are local to that region that that can help you get off the ground, um, I think is is a consideration. Um, but I agree with everything that that's been said about this this region and, and its strengths. So just uh, to carry on. Uh, just your particular problem in Boston, like every location would be different, but do you think that you didn't get the funding based on like the number of investors and they're just not open up, so maybe the culture here is better, or is it just there is no interest for the investors in Boston in what you guys want to do? Because there could be a, a company who had an idea in Boston just is all over it, so 
So what do you, do you have an idea or an opinion on why you had to move out here to get started? Yeah, so like what Jeremy was saying, um, 50 to 20 years ago, the venture capital and startup ecosystems in Boston and Silicon Valley were neck and neck. Boston was renowned for the, for the biotech corridor and Silicon Valley had done a lot of like physical silicon chips, which is the, the, the uh, origin of the name. And um, about 15 to 10 years ago, that began to change and Silicon Valley began to pull ahead in a big way. Um, and a, a, a turning point was when Mark Zuckerberg also tried to raise money in Boston and couldn't. So he came out to Silicon Valley and that's why Facebook is in uh, Silicon Valley now. And that created sort of uh, a chain reaction where the ecosystem in Silicon Valley really took off and the ecosystem everywhere else really has, has, has not kept pace even, even close. Um, and I, I think the underlying reason is the cultural difference that Jeremy was pointing out before, that um, the people in Silicon Valley were just willing to take bigger risks. They were willing to fund earlier stage companies, companies with crazier ideas, less proven spaces, and Boston has always had a much more conservative culture. In fact, everywhere else in the world outside of Silicon Valley and possibly China has a much more conservative culture. And so they missed out on all the big ideas because all the big ideas seemed kind of crazy at first. And so to, you know, to kind of put it in perspective, like, so when we started Lemnos, you know, one, we didn't have prior startup success. We had never run a venture capital fund before. So even, even at here, people were arguably skeptical. So we raised a little bit of friends and family money and then we started just pitching other investors. And we finally got in front of Naval, who runs Angelus. And in, in very characteristic Naval fashion, he walks in, he sits down, 15 minutes into the pitch, he says, I get it, I love it, I'm in, my buddies are in, but I double booked this. He just walked out. My <laughs> co-founder, I sit there like dumbfounded. Six weeks later, we had a million and a half dollars. Two of those people, I look at the final list, and I'm like, Helen, I don't remember meeting these two people. And you know, as, as with all early stage companies, it's, we, we had a minimum. And so she's like, well, remember these other two people? I said, yeah. I said, well, they didn't want to like, write the minimum, and they said, can I split this with my old co-founder? from a prior company they each had done. So we took 30 minute phone calls with those co-founders and those people each wrote us like $75,000 checks. And like people from the East Coast will hear this story and say, they're insane. And they are insane, except we live in the land of crazy people where like that check can turn into like seven and a half million dollars. Yeah, and like that's, that is like enough people out here have done an angel investment that returned 10, 100 times a thing or their friends did or they started that company and the home runs in Boston aren't doubles here. So I think that the cultural difference is just like compounded on top of it. And so like the, that, that is why I think that this is a great place to be. So considering I'm from this again, uh, I've only been here for like eight days, but I genuinely am already making the cogs worth to try and get me to move here. <laughs> just like get my field soundboard and everything. Um, so, so genuinely like from, from a living here for a week and a bit with these guys here, like seeing the culture, and from what you guys are saying and what's been said all week, uh, it really is just a place for innovation. Do you think there could be a Silicon Valley V2 somewhere else? And where would it be? That's my first question. Well, there already is one actually in China. So, so Is it called Silicon Valley? V2? No, it's no. not. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is the only other startup <laughs> ecosystem that seems on the track to compete. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think there will be another one in the US. Okay, okay. So to move too far ahead, no. Well, I mean, it's interesting because it's like the, you know, there's been $600 billion companies created like in the Western world in the last 30 years. And four of them are here, two in Seattle, and the next two are already like, you know, Uber is going to be the next one. And like, that's crazy when you think about it. And like, and these are, you know, the five of the six biggest companies in the world, like, are now headquartered in the, or like, are the tech companies in the West Coast. Like, like wrap your head around that. It's like, a hundred years ago, like, New York, upstate New York was the center of the world. Like not, not even like Manhattan, I'm talking like, you know, a hundred miles north, like, you know, where Poughkeepsie and all those places are. And like upstate New York hasn't had like a company that like mattered in like 50 years. Uh, the Chris, second year question I have is more of a general one. <coughs> so I absolutely value the uh, networking and community of possibilities we've got here. So I was wondering if you could comment on, I mean, I've made some really good friends and colleagues here, and I'm just hoping we keep in contact forever. Do you like me? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on like the kind of community feel we've got here and to keep that going in the future with that sort of thing. 
So one thing that uh, the YC founders do is um, you know, after, after the program ends, we don't do the weekly meetings anymore. Um, but a lot of the YC founders miss the, the close camaraderie that they have with the other people who are going through the program. And so a lot of the founders organize dinners themselves for their friends from the program. So that's something that you guys might consider doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably the most valuable thing. I mean, ho ho hopefully you've learned something from us, but I think like the relationships you'll build here are gonna be the most valuable thing that comes out of this, this boot camp. So do whatever you can to stay in touch. Let's hear Chris and Aries. I, just, uh, I was going to follow up from the previous question about locations. So I want to um, echo Richard's sentiments. I mean, I came to Berkeley for grad school, and just I never thought I'd be the nuclear innovation boot camp, and I never thought I'd be considering, you know, how can I be a startup or start a startup. Um, I'm curious with when it comes to hardware companies, though. So maybe this is where the founders need to be, but you know, there are regions where there's certain hardware that's needed. I mean. Part of the appeal of Philadelphia is that Pennsylvania is going to need some new clean energy, and New Jersey is invested, and these utilities invested in new nuclear energy. So I'm curious, um, in terms of experience with hardware, uh, how you handle those regional markets. There's 10 million people in the Bay Area. You know, I, I grew up down in LA. I was talking to somebody about this earlier, and funny, we talk, tell people from LA, they're always like, oh, Hollywood. Because Hollywood is successful, definitionally, because everyone knows about Hollywood. The reality is, is like, my dad was in the Navy. LA is one of the largest aerospace industries in the world. You know, the Valley kind of went Hollywood in that, like, you know, let's be clear, like, the largest company in the world is a hardware company that has 13,000 employees in the Bay Area. Like, every consumer device you own is designed by someone in the Bay Area. The Xbox group is here. The F everything Amazon makes is designed in the Bay Area. Like, Samsung has giant centers here. So, like, the, the, there is this mythology that kind of hardware left. And it wasn't that hardware left, it's that like, the reason you know that Google and Facebook are such big companies is because they're social facing, consumer facing companies, so definitely everyone has to know it. There's still satellites built next across the runway from Google. So I think that uh, I, I, there's very few, and we've done a pretty wide variety of investments, there's almost, I, I don't think we've had any company ever say, you know, crap, I just can't find like, someone who understands like RF communications or something like that. Um, you know, honestly, the, when I lecture at most universities, I say, if you're an electrical engineer and go into firmware, like, the Bay Area has all of them and we don't have enough. So I, I think that maybe so for some, you know, to Jared's point, there may be some certain very specific infrastructure stuff. But I, I got to say, you know, GE, an old school company who builds big things, they're hiring 1,200 people in the Bay Area. They want to be one of the largest software employers in the world. And they know that growth is going to come here. I think another another way to think about your question is is the concerns about like regional markets and what's going to be happening in those regional markets are you know you want to be thinking about those now but as you're getting started th those aren't going to be the critical bottlenecks at this stage for your for your venture um, so you know much more important is the the infrastructure and the support network and the financing ecosystem, et cetera, that's going to allow your startup to actually get off the ground and, and thrive. And then later when you're you know, looking at deploying you know, utility markets, um, those opportunities will, you'll, you'll be able to build bridges back to those opportunities. Um, like you guys keep talking about Silicon Valley, right? But uh, so I don't know which issue, but a few months ago, uh, Entrepreneur Magazine made a top 50 list for the United States and actually Boulder right now is the number one place if you want to make a startup. You're that Carolyn? So. Yeah, the, I'll just respond to that comment that those lists are total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just saying there are other places. I, I, was, I was just in Boulder and talking to a startup, like one of the, one of the, the, one of the Sphere of founders, which was one of the most successful startups in Boulder, and he's like, we can't find office space that can hold more than a couple hundred people, so we have to move together. He's like, Boulder hates us. He's like, Boulder wants us to leave. <laughs> so. Architecture? Um, there's a, a quote by Shackleton that with endurance you conquer things and a problem for our industry is that we're mixing two things. We've got an agency of now this crisis that we're trying to sort out and we've got really long lead times on getting the reactors that will fix it to market. So uh, you guys sound pretty knowledgeable about the nuclear industry. I know that's not your, your necessarily your main thing, but how, how do you see the next, you know, 
it, it can't come quick enough, but which reactors are coming up first, or you know, how do we get them there quicker, or any of those kind of time scale related issues that you want to just that you've thought about from reading the literature, you know, because we're talking Gen 3 or SMRs, you know, in the, in the short term, you know, the next 10 years, and then molten salts to close the fuel cycle in the next 20, 30 years. We've got the regulators, it takes 20, 20 years to get a new reactor to market. And just some thoughts on that, though. Maybe more generally, what makes those those long lead time projects most like what what gets a, a product to market fastest in something that is long lead time? Is that a yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I can comment on the, the nuclear specific piece of it. I, you know, I think the the types of companies that we support at Cyclotron Road are all, uh, you know. Probably you know, ten plus years to market, um, and I think you know again. I think an important piece of it, and part of the piece that we're trying to solve, is how do you align those types of projects with the right types of financing and partnerships to that that can work with that kind of time scale. Um, I think the nuclear industry in particular has, um, you know, a lot of people in the nuclear industry. Some folks in this room have been thinking about how to actually bring more innovation into the, the nuclear industry and how to um, accelerate uh, that innovation process. I think that is a broader systemic issue, and you know, thinking about the regulatory landscape and how you actually, you know, there are cultural cultural issues there. Um, so it is. I think it is a challenging road ahead, but I think that there are great opportunities to to, you know, I think. Especially now, people are thinking about this. There are people with a lot of money investing in nuclear. Um, it's it's becoming a better and better time to I think get started doing doing something in nuclear. Um, but it's going to be a long, hard road. Um, I don't I don't have a good window into what's coming down the pipeline beyond that time frame. But I think I also think that like there there's been some really you know for me very like uh, exciting developments from a regulatory. Thresholds, and if you, you know, for very specifically around self-driving cars and around drones. I mean, when you know we 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 were the first uh, institutional investor in Airware um, four years ago, and at the time, it's like there were no drone regulations. It wasn't really legal. It was super sketchy. And as of three weeks ago, there were like these new regs came out, which Airware helped write, which makes it legal to fly drones in non-populated areas up to 400 feet without a permit with just a single license, right? And so, and, and sure, like you know, nuclear is certainly has some baggage on it and like has a little bit of fear mongering on it. But I think that you know, in general, like from a 25 year approval cycle, like is there a way to like either, you know, shop for more, you know, favorable regulatory conditions. Uh, I know that Leslie spoke earlier, I know she's doing some work in China. And so it's actually easier to get the US government to say, I will let you export this stuff to China and like, you know, they can approve it over there than it is for her to actually get the approvals to do that stuff here. So I think there's certainly been some really interesting precedents and also, I mean, one thing that makes the United States fascinating is just that the states have such enormous power to control their own destiny. You know, California hates nuclear, right? We're closing the last plant here, like we're totally fucked on that one. But the reality is Nevada actually has shown to be very, very welcoming in terms of a lot of other regulatory environments. They have one of the five major test centers for drones. They were like, I think they beat us in self-driving cars and they've certainly been more welcoming for self-driving cars. And like the, there's nothing systemic about nuclear. Yes, it is more dangerous. We need to have a little bit more rigor, but I don't think there's anything God given about a 20, 25 year kind of regulatory cycle. I'll make one last comment on that. So um, the, the Oklo founders, which is the fission reactor company, when they were going through YC, they went and they talked to a law firm that does a lot of nuclear regulatory work and they engaged them to figure out what it would take to get the Oak Grove reactor approved. And the firm came back and they said, mm, minimum 10 to 20 years. And we talked to them and we said, well, that's just not good enough because you're not going to live that long without a working product to so figure out how to do it faster. So they got a copy of all the regulatory codes themselves and they read the whole thing and they understood it and they went and they talked to a lot of smart people and they figured out a way to do it so that they could get approved in a few years. So, you know, they're like, like you're saying, like if you, if you take a really determined attitude, there's usually a way to make things go faster. Do you want to say something? Build a reference. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, we're gonna have a cage fight after this. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have a roof we can throw each other off. I mean, I'll let the, the other guy speak. You know, for us, it's like with our fund size, we can write up to million dollar checks. And so, like being co-investors is you know either investing after or before. I mean, for us. I mean, in general, the way we view it, it's a it's a small hardware community. There's really no need to like you know pull knives and like um, I think that in general it's like you know good companies get funded. I think that you know like it's like I know a bunch of the partners at YC. Like we've talked about hardware, we've looked at some of the deals. Um, we're co-investors in Airware, um, so I mean I, I don't think there's any reason to like you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how you guys feel, but uh, yeah. I mean I would say we generally when we look at the the broader incubator landscape, view ourselves as or earlier in the pipeline where the types of projects that we're supporting at the stage that they're at, where they're, they're really kind of at proof concept stage, um, we expect some of our companies to go on to then enter an incubator when they leave our program. Um, that being said, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we'd actually be really eager to learn from YC about the way that they're thinking about hard tech and um, some of these types of companies. So I think, um, you know, we don't see it as competitive. We're really aimed at that really earliest stage, and we're sort of we're running our experiment. And actually, when we look at the ecosystem, we think that there need to be more people running different experiments at every stage of the pipeline to figure out what are the models that works that work uh, for different types of technologies. Um. Okay, we'll get one more question. So are there not for profit ones? Not for profit ones. Well, so Sebastian, you kind of mentioned the DOE structure one. Uh, well, so our so our program is funded by DOE. Um, right now, all, all the startups that are in it are for profit uh, entities. Um, we wouldn't be opposed to if someone thought that the right way to take their technology to scale it was to to do a totally different you know approach go to do a non profit model. Um, and there are also incubators and accelerator programs specifically for nonprofits um, that are out there. So um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that's gone through a couple of uh, incubators for that, and they've found that really helpful. So, so, you know, both for us specifically and more broadly, there's resources out there for nonprofit efforts. Is it? I think we're at. Well, you got one minute. It's a pending question. Okay. Perfect. Could you guys like? sort of concisely state your motivation for, for working in this, as opposed to starting just one specific technology company or something like that. What is the motivation for being an incubator and accelerator? I thought it was the best way to expand the amount of innovation in the world. Yeah, for, for us, I mean, we started them this because at the time there was no really good ecosystem for early stage hardware. And so for us, it's like as hardware people, we like we thought that needed to change in the world. And the thing that continues to motivate me is very, very similar. It's that I get to work with 10 <coughs> awesome new companies every year that are working on, you know, like ultra low cost satellites or the future of robotics. And I think that that kind of stuff, you know, I find really exciting. It, it really is like, you know, we get to build the future. Like we get to build all the science fiction stuff I grew up on. And like, that's, that's the world I want to be a part of. Yeah, I, I think for us, it, you know, we, our, our team had, well, a few of our folks on our team have started companies before, and we looked at the ecosystem and saw that there were some gaps that we were interested in trying to develop solutions to fill, um, and the ability to, to impact you know, a bunch of startups and a bunch of efforts and, uh, is, is really exciting, and I think you know, is what motivates us. What motivates you all? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, science is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much.